things off. I do just want to acknowledge that for today, um, me and several of our speakers are joining from UW Tacoma, which means we are joining um, from the traditional lands of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. Um, we, and as we think about orcas in particular, want to be mindful of the significance culturally and in terms of many of the tribes seeing them as, as um, honored, treasured relatives and the stewardship and leadership that they have had since time immemorial and continuing to follow that as we have these conversations about the path forward and the science and the knowledge uh, informing that. So with that, Joel, I think you had a quick announcement and then we'll hand it over to Joe. Thank you, Marielle. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to, my name is Joel Baker. I'm the director of the University of Washington Puget Sound Institute. I just wanted to thank all of you for joining. Thank Marielle for her skills in organizing these things. And just to say, this is my favorite time of the month because I get to sit back for an hour and just listen to other people talk about science and think broad thoughts. And I can think of no better person to share lunch with virtually than my good friend, Joe Gatos at CDOX. CDOX has been a, a leader in Puget Sound, Salish Sea science for as long as I've known about this there was such a thing so we're really glad that joe and his group have stepped up today to, to lead the discussion so without further ado um i will turn it over to my good friend joe gatos from cdox yeah thanks joel thanks marielle and thanks to uh, uh all of you for hosting this thanks for everybody to, for showing up today um it's great to uh, have all of you here it's great to have rob and ruth and andy to speak i, I want to first introduce rob I met Rob over 20 years ago when he was a nascent scientist, and I think I've spent a huge part of my career reading his papers since then. So he's extremely well published in Southern Residence and Northern Residence and all kinds of different whales and not just on acoustics uh, and um, cumulative effects, but also on distribution and other things like that. He and uh, his partner, Aaron Ash, started Oceans Initiative. If you haven't checked it out, please check out their website, get their emails. They're doing really cool stuff. And um, a few years ago, I think it was 2016 or 2017, Rob, I'm sure you'll let us know. Um, Rob and Bob Lacey and a bunch of other scientists did a population viability analysis looking at what we you know, needed to do, looking at the cumulative, cumulative effects of Southern resident killer whales. And today he's going to talk about the update of that. So without any Further discussion on my part, I'd like to turn it over to you, Rob. Thank you. Well, thanks, Joe. That was a, a, a very gracious introduction. Um, and thank you all for inviting me to uh, speak about this, this population model that, uh, that I did. Um, I, I'm going to just skip the title slide um, and, um, and just point out right away that I wanna thank Puget Sound Partnership for funding this work to try to understand the cumulative effects of, of lots of di different stressors. Um, SCTV, SCTI refers to um, uh, Bob Lacey's program and Bob Lacey is the inventor of, of program Vortex, which is a free software program that allows you to model the fate of individuals and the population dynamics, um, the demographic rates all emerge from that individual based model as uh, Joe mentioned, Aaron Ash and I are with Oceans Initiative, but we have a great team of people, uh, most of which, most of whom are co-authors on the resulting paper. Um, we did this with Raincoast Conservation Foundation, bringing some expertise on genetics from Lance Barrett Leonard and contaminants from uh, Peter Ross. And then of course, uh, Tanya Brown from Fisheries and Oceans Canada brought her expertise on um, not just PCBs, but um, contaminants of emerging concern and some of the work that they're, they're doing to try to understand what could this toxic soup be doing to uh, the salmon and, and ultimately the killer whales. I didn't have a logo for Stephen Raverty here, um, but but Stephen Raverty, of course, is, is Joe, can I say it? He's the one guy who does all of the necropsies on killer whales in, in Canadian when they strand in, in Canada. And uh, he, he just knows an awful lot about pathology and disease and some pretty incredible work. In addition, we had some other wildlife vets from uh, uh, 
SeaWorld from uh, the North Slope Borough up in Alaska, and uh, one of my heroes from uh, the Marine Mammal Center. Um, and so I, I want to start out by saying that that this was a very collaborative effort, and uh, that's something that CDOC does routinely. Um, it was really important to me that that we included a broad range of, of expertise, a broad range of threats, a uh, broad range of uh, ideas about contamin uh, about mitigation uh, methods. You all know, of course, that Southern resident killer whales were listed under the Canada Species at Risk Act in 2001 and listed under the uh, U.S. Endangered Species Act in 2005. I was part of the original killer whale recovery team uh, in Canada. And of course, we listed those three main threats to recovery, not enough food, too much noise, and some contaminants. But there was no information in 2001 to really rank those and understand the relative importance. And so that has been really our guiding mission since that 2017 uh, population viability analysis with Bob Lacey that, that Joe alluded to, and I'll, I'll get to that in, in just a second. So the threats have been known uh, for over two decades, but the relative importance, the magnitude um, of the effect of those threats on demography is a work in progress. And by definition, that means without knowing how much of an impact they're having on survival and reproduction, by definition, that means that we don't um, necessarily have good numbers for mitigation. Um, we don't know how much is too much. We don't know how much mitigation will be needed to guide recovery. And that was the purpose of this, this project. Um, as Joe mentioned, in 2017, Bob Lacey and several of us uh, published uh, a population viability analysis that tried to put lack of prey, noise, and contaminants in the same currency, namely their individual and cumulative effect on the probability that an individual killer whale would survive um, and that a female would reproduce. It was published in scientific reports in 2017. Of course, that's an open access journal. So we put the actual model, we put all the inputs um, online. Um, we hoped it would stimulate discussion. And I think it did. You know, I, I, I think one place where it, it stimulated a lot of discussion was at Governor Inslee's Orca Task Force. And I, I, I think that barring any other targets, um, I think that our um, our paper really kind of set the tone for how much uh, recovery we, we thought it would take. I think in that paper, I think we estimated it would take something like 30% more salmon to get the population growing as quickly as we'd like, or some combination like a 15% increase in Chinook salmon abundance and a 50% decrease in noise and disturbance. 2017, I don't know about you guys, it feels like it was yesterday, um, but a lot has changed since then. And I think on the, the killer whale side, of course, the population has declined. Um, I, I, I don't know if you're all familiar with um, the excellent workshops that um, Ray Hilborn and Andrew Trites convened at UBC and University of Washington to try to understand the effects of fisheries on uh, uh, Southern resident killer whale um, recovery. Um, spent a whole lot of work by people like Derek Dapp and Eric Ward uh, at the Pacific Salmon Commission modeling the effects of uh, Chinook salmon indices on killer whale uh, reproduction mostly. Uh, there have been some challenges uh, in in the courts. Raincoast and Wild Fish Conservancy used some of those earlier models in their interventions on Southeast Alaska fisheries that were catching a lot of Chinook. Uh, and then, of course, last year there was this uh, uh, really important paper by Cardos that made us realize that inbreeding may be a bigger problem than we had uh, thought. On the human side, of course, 
man, there are a whole lot of applications and uh, an actual development underway. I mean, the Roberts Bank Terminal 2 port expansion uh, is poised to, to start uh, soon. Uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline is, you know, the, the construction has started. Uh, the, the oil tankers will be coming soon. So we knew we needed to update the, the model for those reasons. Um, and then on the mitigation side, it looks as though um, on both sides of the border, uh, agencies are far more willing now than they were maybe 10, 15 years ago to consider fisheries management that is sufficiently precautionary to ensure survival and recovery of southern resident killer whales. DFO has done some important work to uh, identify key foraging areas and keep boats out of them so that whales have undis you know, places to hunt undisturbed. Uh, certainly on the US side, I'm, I'm familiar with WDFW's work on uh, licensing the whale watching fleet. Um, and then of course the ship slowdowns led by the Port of Vancouver's ECHO program and now being picked up by the ports of Seattle and Tacoma are are resulting in meaningful drops in ocean noise in Harrow Strait and, and we hope in Puget Sound. Um, but we're still missing something. The population is not recovering. And so we need to know, um, what do we need to know to make better predictions of, about survival and recovery? And I think the 2017 paper was focused so much on extinction, which of course we all know could be caused by one, you know, God forbid, disease outbreak or one oil spill. But we really need to start thinking about the smaller actions that are necessary just to prevent recovery. So in that 2017 paper, we relied very, very heavily on two really important papers by John Ford in 2010 and Eric Ward in 2009. Hope you can see them. Um, I'll use my mouse. Um, does that show up? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, and we can also send links out as well after. Great. So John Ford first pointed out in 2010 that in years, this is killer whale mortality index on the y-axis, and they both share, um, both plots share the same Chinook Salmon Abundance Index with one being an average year, an average over 20 or 30 year period. In good salmon years, um, which are high on this x-axis, in good salmon years, we have fewer deaths in the Northern and Southern resident killer whale um, communities than you would expect by chance alone, just from the, the age and sex distribution of the population. Um, in poor salmon years, then we have higher than expected death rates. And he did the same thing with birth rates where the birth in indices, you had more calves being born in good salmon years and fewer calves being born in poor salmon years. Eric Ward, uh, looked mostly at Southern resident killer whales. That was the focus of the paper, but the, the analysis had to borrow strength from Northern resident killer whale data. And he found that after accounting for the effect of age on a female's probability to reproduce, uh, that there was this nice linear relationship uh, between the West Coast Vancouver Island Chinook Abundance Index with a one year time lag that in, again, in good salmon years, you have a higher than expected, higher than average probability of calving after accounting for the effect of age. In poor salmon years, um, you have a lower than expected probability of calving. But those, although those papers were published in 2009 and 10, the, you know, it, it's the nature of publishing, publishing science that the the indices themselves, the data stopped in something like 2006 or seven. Um, and so in some of these meetings at the Pacific Salmon Commission and at the Hillborn Trites workshops, Eric was saying, hey, it looks as though that relationship is weakening. Uh, we called on our donor community, we at Oceans Initiative, and said, we really need to update this. It's, you know, 
2007. Um, gosh, um, it, it's 15 years out of date. And we raised enough money to hire Ben Nelson. Dr. Ben Nelson finished his PhD at UBC, has a, a really strong background in Bayesian statistics and integrated population models. So if we go back to this uh, important work by John Ford, he treated births and deaths as separate processes. Ben's uh, work integrated these into uh, a single population model so that survival and reproduction are in the same uh, model. And we updated this. We only use Southern resident killer whale data. And although um, the sample size is really small, the effect of Chinook salmon abundance on survival uh, is statistically significant. Um, there is a lot of support from the data for a model that includes uh, an effect of Chinook salmon on uh, survival. The, the effect on fecundity or reproduction, having a calf and having that calf survive to six months uh, is admittedly weaker. But if you think about the number of coin tosses, um, you know, if we have 74 whales in the population, you can toss the coin, you can toss 74 coins every year to get your survival rate. If you're trying to understand the effect of salmon on fecundity, you're really only looking at the, the number of reproductively active, reproductively aged females who have a calf every three to five years. And so instead of 74 coin tosses, this relationship on the bottom is based on maybe 12 coin tosses each year. And yet um, the evidence there is more evidence for an effect of salmon on fecundity than not. Um, now this matters obviously for the salmon part of, of our population level, but it also matters because all of the noise mitigation scenarios that we ran um, or all the noise impact scenarios that we ran enter the model by reducing the proportion of prey available in the environment that is accessible to the whales. So noise we treat as just some factor that is um, that is removing some portion of the, the prey. I won't go over vortex too much. I've already talked about the fact that it is uh, an individu individual based model that, that allows events to occur probabil probabilistically probabilistically, you toss a coin each year um, and that you're not estimating, there's no single equation where you're estimating population growth rate, for example, the population dynamics emerge from the collective fates of all of these individuals that are in, in the model. It's a wonderful tool. Um, it seems silly on, on one hand to go from a very advanced, uh, sophisticated Bayesian integrated population model to uh, vortex, and yet it makes sense because for many things, like the effects of contaminants of emerging concern, we have scenarios um, that are hypothetical, that are not necessarily based on empirical data. Vortex is wonderful for, for running scenarios like that. It's also wonderful for comparing and contrasting how much benefit would we get from alternative mitigation measures. So I, I just wanna start with one slide. This to me is the most important uh, result that, that came out of the, the model. This is time on the x-axis, which goes from zero to 100 years. This is population growth rate. It's a little hard to see, but this is a decline of 1%, a decline of 2%. And the mean, fate, this is without considering any anthropogenic threats, just based on the age, sex, class, you know, the distribution of the population as it stands now. Um, the mean is this red line. And so we expect that with no additional threats, just from status quo, we expect an, a decline of uh, a baseline decline of one and a half percent per year. Um, the important thing is if this were some sort of random deviation 
around a small population size, you'd get something like this blue line. And instead, in every scenario that we ran, the population was declining at about one and a half percent per year for a generation or two. And then that decline accelerates as we run out of reproduct reproductively aged females. This is a characteristic signature of a population that is teetering on the edge of an extinction vortex. Um, this is a classic signature of a species that is about to go extinct. And so I, I want to stress the urgency that we have one or two generations to mitigate these threats, um, or we will, or we will likely lose this population. So the key updates from the 2023 PVA, I've re, I've said this already that it, it updates the baseline model with newer data on the prey demography link. That's the the very sophisticated uh, uh, model that Ben Nelson did with Eric Ward and it's uh, in press at Ecosphere. Um, we did include individ uh, additional processes and threats. Um, we considered that PCBs, of course, are declining over time, but there is a lag. We tried um, to include contaminants other than PCBs. Um, the, the reason I fixate on PCBs is that Elsa Hall really stuck her neck out. Elsa Hall, professor at University of St. Andrews, and, and constructed a model that links the annual accumulation rate of PCBs to the probability that a calf will or will not survive. And so it is the it was the only quantitative dose response curve that I could include in a population model. Um, it only looks at the PCBs and it only looks at one pathway of effects, namely the effect of that accumulation rate on calf survival. We know that there are other contaminants out there. We know that there are other pathways of effects. They can make uh, adults sick. You know, it could affect adult survival. It could prevent a female from becoming pregnant in the first place. We just don't have re quantitative relationships yet linking those other contaminants through other pathways of effects to demography of southern resident killer whales. But I do hope that Ruth and Andy have some ideas on that or that we can work on that together because Elsa invest Elsa and her colleagues invested so much work in building that model to um, predict population consequences of PCBs. And I, you know, as a longtime member of the International Whaling Commission Scientific Committee, I want to point out that Elsa's work was was part of uh, a program that was called Pollution 2000 Plus, and it's now called Pollution 2020 Plus. So she has been working on this for 20 years. This is hard stuff. Um, and yet she does have some, uh, some way to predict population consequences of PCBs. I really urge, I'm, I'm emphasizing this because I think a really important next step is to consider contaminants other than PCBs. The model included climate mediated declines in Chinook salmon uh, abundance, but also the size and their energy density. Um, we considered oil spills. Um, on the mitigation side, we we are really, I don't know if you saw the fantastic coverage in the New York Times of the work that CDOC and others do to intervene um, when a whale gets sick, but we, we spent an awful lot of time with veterinarians and pathologists trying to figure out how many of what we're calling natural mortality of uh, calves, juveniles, and adults could be preventable or at least delayed if, uh, if we had more funding for just close monitoring and, uh, and interventions where we think they're likely to prevent a whale from becoming sick or a sick whale from dying. And it's substantial. I think we need to pay closer attention to that. We also considered some scenarios around uh, fishery reductions or improvements to uh, salmon spawning habitat. 
Um, this is Ben Nelson's uh, result in, in a slightly different way um, with survival on the y-axis and that same Chinook index on the x-axis, which uh, is centered on one. Um, if we could get back to the good years that we haven't seen since the early 80s, we could get survival um, of adults back up in 0.98, um, certainly above 0.95, which is where they need to be. Um, calf survival is, is always going to be lower than adult survival, but we think that there is a way to get it higher than 0.5, which is what it has been in, 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 uh, bad years, bad chin of years. The bottom plot is again, Ben Nelson's, uh, the output of Ben Nelson's model that just shows how the reproductive rate of a young female um, uh, increases as Chinook salmon increases. So this, uh, Bob fondly calls these spaghetti plots. Um, and we will be cert. I hope, um, Marielle, we will be circulating the slides after the talk so that people can see this, this figure. Yes, um, we will. Great. Um, so you'll, these are, um, they take some time to interpret 50% uh, in, in this case represents status quo. Uh, here is the Chinook Salmon Abundance Index. You can see that that purple line is, is still, notwithstanding the, the weakening relationship, that is still our, our biggest lever um, to influence population growth. And if we could get, um, uh, salmon numbers back up to what we were seeing in the 70s and 80s, uh, we would get some positive population growth rate. Note that this is a growth rate of zero. This is a stable population. Um, so that is uh, humbling. Um, salmon restoration, in contrast to the 2017 PBA, it's a necessary, it is still very much a necessary part of recovering uh, uh, southern resident killer whales. But salmon restoration alone will not get us a uh, positive population growth rate, let alone anything like the 2.3% um, population growth rate we would like, or population growth rates that we're seeing in northern resident killer whales or that we have seen um, in southern resident killer whales in previous decades. So there is this plot that we put in the paper, which is um, uh, now down to very minor revisions. I hope it's coming out soon. Uh, we, we considered combinations of mitigation um, with the most idyllic, optimistic um, uh, scenario being called the road to recovery. If we could somehow magically eliminate all threats, eliminate all human-caused mortality, um, we get population growth rate that is about 1.4%. But this is, this is, uh, unrealistic. I think, I think I can just say it's an unrealistic scenario. It, it, it imagines that we could somehow, um, mediate, um, or remove PCBs from the environment, for example. Um, we included one that we call slow recovery, which I think is a little bit more optim, a little bit more realistic. This is more like fifteen percent increases in Chinook salmon abundance, um, fifty percent reduction in noise, which Echo and um, Quiet Sound are achieving. Um, WDFW is achieving that through their small vessel um, regulations. So that will get us popu uh, positive population growth. It gets us out of the decline. Um, but it's still a heavy lift. And I think this is the one that we really should pay attention to. Uh, what would it take just to stop the decline? What would it take for persistence, for just a, a stable population? At a minimum, it's a 15% increase in Chinook. Um, it presumes that, you know, somehow we're able to build some climate resilience or dam removals or something to offset the uh, imminent 
uh, effects of climate change. Again, it assumes a 50% reduction in noise and disturbance, which I think we can do, but it's this next bullet point that I think is worthy of uh, some discussion. We need to prevent half of what we think are human-caused mortalities. Uh, here's a picture that uh, Katie Foster took of J50 several years ago, who showed up with uh, parasites in her scat. Unfortunately, the vets were unable to deliver uh, a deworming medication before she died. We didn't; she wasn't seen until she showed up with um, severe emaciation. I don't know if she could have been saved um, had we seen her earlier. That's a question for Joe and, and others. Um, but I, I know that at Oceans Initiative, our own work is, is now focused on trying to see whether, can we use behavior, um, slower swimming speeds. Um, we do land-based theodolite tracking. So we're testing whether slower swimming speeds or um, shorter dive intervals may be a precursor to showing up in poor body condition. And maybe that would allow us to say, hey, Joe, go and uh, check this one out because they're behaving ab abnormally. And I think in terms of mitigation, uh, I love Washington State's phrase that uh, mitigation has to result in net ecological gain. So we're not talking about the status quo. Uh, we need mitigation measures that more than mitigate. And so, I'm nearing the end here. Some factors that are within local control, fisheries management, noise, others that are out with our control, you know, uh, locally, regionally, um, not, we're not able to do much about uh, climate change at a scale and on, a, you know, in a time frame that would, that would benefit the Chinook now and the killer whales five years from now when they, when the Chinook are adults. Uh, but more precautionary management of Chinook fisheries would help. At Oceans Initiative, we're partnering with a company called Genus Wave and University of St. Andrews to test non-lethal ways to deter seals and sea lions from uh, bottlenecks so that we can increase fish passage and try to get more salmon to their spawning stream. Um, we really like this uh, idea of enhanced protection of key foraging areas. Uh, my wife, Erin Ash, published the first paper on that concept in 2010, um, and we're happy to see it scaled up um, and expanded. Um, and all of the efforts to reduce vessel noise and disturbance um, are, are important, and especially important as we consider development act, uh, proposals that, that would increase uh, vessel noise. We've talked about the health, and I think the last point here is to just manage the expectations Population recovery will be under any scenario will be slow, um, and it will require long time scales. Um, and so, in our own work, we really want to just do some modeling exercises to try to say how much do we, how much resilience do we think this population has to withstand um, the cumulative effects of all of these um, threats? How much is too much? Uh, I've talked about this uh, veterinary health plan that I hope Joe will talk about a little bit more, but I think if we could model it on the transboundary oil spill response plan, that would be great. I've talked about how behavior may predict um, health issues, and I'm so glad Andy and Ruth are here to talk about contaminants of emerging concern, because I know that we've, we've invested a lot in modeling population consequences of PCBs. I'd love to work with them to model population consequences of everything but PCBs. Um, and with that, I'll thank you very much and turn it over to Marielle. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Andy and Ruth. In the meantime, feel free to add questions into the chat Q&A or after this, we'll also be able to raise your hand and we'll unmute you during the Q&A, thanks. Thank you, Rob. And uh, just checking that I'm uh, screen sharing is good, Mario. Good, perfect. Uh, Mario's right behind me in the in the same room. So, um, yeah, no. Again, thanks for that that presentation. And um, what Ruth and I are going to talk about today is that translation from the, the translation to sort of investigation into contaminants of emerging concern and trying to figure out um, 
which of those are important and by important, we mean that, that, that there's a potential for them to have biological impacts. And so I'm going to start by, by talking briefly about some past work that we've done that we think leads us in the direction of, of figuring out how these contaminants might, um, might impact the southern resident killer whale. Um, and just want to make sure to acknowledge that, that we're part of a big collaboration with, with um, ourselves. So I'm, I'm from UW Tacoma. Again, my name is Andy James. Ruth Sofield's here. She's from Western Washington uh, University. And we're representing a team, uh, including Maya Faber, uh, Molly Schumann Goodyear, Louisa Harding, Sandy O'Neill, and Russ Ladley. And there's there's quite a uh, bit of folks interested in in this topic, and, and um, it's great to work on this kind of collaboration. So um, Again, I'll briefly talk about things that we've done in the past, and then Ruth, Ruth will take that translation of um, how we think they might uh, uh, be used for SRKW. Um, and, and so this project that we had is a Puget Sound Partnership funded project, and we had three kind of main objectives. One was to look at contaminants of emerging concern themselves and figure out which ones matter biologically. Uh, then we wanted to, to to spend some time looking at mixtures since we know that that mixtures occur uh, in the Puget Sound, and then develop a framework for the the, the these chemicals in, in particular and SRKW. Um, and and so we're we're going to give a real brief high level overview of the past work. Um, and and the the first objective again screening and prioritization of contaminants of emerging concern. And just to um, highlight what we mean by that, so contaminants of emerging concern are, are mainly anthropogenic compounds that are occurring in the environment. So we have evidence that they, they're out there. Um, and then the, the the emerging and the concern part is, is where we um, do some investigation because we, you know, maybe there's some evidence that they matter, but but we don't really know for sure. Um, and so we're operating in a space where there are limited, uh, there's limited information on, on what happens or, you know, where they're occurring or how they behave. And so what we're trying to do is take multiple lines of evidence, mul multiple lines of, of imperfect evidence, and apply that to give some kind of uh, prioritization or, or um, uh, judgment of, of these chemicals. And so just, just to, I think you can see the cursor, but but what we're doing is taking information like uh, in silico predictions of chemical toxicity. We're taking information on species sensitivity, species sensitivity distributions. Um, there's there's a little bit of work on in vivo toxicology and in vitro. So this is this is more um, um, small scale work. We're not going to talk about that much detail anyway, but we're taking each of these lines of evidence and based on whether it concurs or disagrees, giving some priority ranking to a particular contaminant. Um, and so so based on these lines of evidence, we end up with a priority framework. Um, and in the first phase, the, the work we were looking at individual chemicals in the environment on sort of an agnostic fish that was out there. Um, so we didn't, didn't uh, consider species too much at that point. But based on the evidence that, that we came up with, we had 57 high priority chemicals and I've, I've listed them, them here. Um, you can find more information on our, our, our publication. But the, the point being that we think the presence of these at the concentrations that have been measured in the environment, again, matter. And so there's, you know, for the example, I just talked about this before, this melphalan, it's a, it's a chemotherapy agent, and we think it has the potential to be negatively affecting organisms in the environment. Um, again, this is on a, a chemical by chemical basis. Um, and so we have recently been finalizing our work on, on mixtures. And again, um, acknowledging the, the the fact that that chemicals are, you know, so it's a, it's a um, low concentration chemical soup in the Puget Sound. So, so almost anywhere we look, we find multiple anthropogenic compounds. And, and so what we're doing now is, is focusing on the use of in vitro information to evaluate the combination of different, different chemicals um, to the same endpoint. And so the exercise that we did was to um, evaluate the, the effects of mixtures on endocrine disruption. Um, again, we have, we're finalizing a publication on that and, and we'll, that should be out shortly. But kind of on the past work, that's all I wanted to say really, just to give a high level view of, of, of the fact that we're looking at contaminants of emerging concern and trying to prioritize them. Um, and also trying to figure out specifically what information we have on particular biological impacts. And I think that's where the translation into the Southern resident killer whale space happens for us. Um, and, and so again, through this partnership project, um, what we wanted to do is develop a framework under which we could, could start considering contaminants of emerging concern and killer whale. Um, and then we did some sort of pilot level activity 
um, looking at exposure response scenarios for SRKW and selected CECs and selected because there's not much information. And then apply, again, these are these are pilot scale evaluations. And Ruth is going to talk about one of those now. So I think she should, I can't see her on the screen, but I, I think she's- Hi, Andy. Here, there oh, she is. So I'll it. hand it over and I'll just, just, uh, just let me know when to advance. Okay. Um, and so again, so as part of that Puget Sound Partnership funded project, where we ranked and prioritized chemicals that are present in Puget Sound that we think are present at high enough concentrations to cause some kind of response. We also developed this framework for how to think about how the, um, how we apply that approach and other aspects of what we know about contaminants and uh, in, in the aquatic system, how we apply that to the SRKWs. And so we started with a conceptual model, which is described here. And again, we are focused on CECs in this work. And we looked at, and if you can just kind of advance, we looked at the different ways through which um, the, or the SRKWs would be exposed to the chemicals. And we considered dietary exposures and how that would be both a source of CEC contaminate or exposure to the SRKWs, but also something that would reduce prey availability and so could impact um, prey for the SRKWs. And then we also considered effects in our model and we looked at effects, not as a specific effect on the SRKWs, but um, by looking at bioactivity with a focus on in vitro, uh, in vitro toxicity data, which was a big kind of advance and hallmark of the work that we have already published. And so if Andy, if you could go to the next slide, I'm gonna first focus on the exposure approach that we did. And in all of this work so far, we've relied on both chemical and toxicity and bioactivity information from other uh, researchers. This is not information we're generating ourselves. And this is an example where we have information on concentrations of CECs in SRKWs. And this paper came out at a really opportune time for us when we were thinking about the SRK model and our framing quite a bit. And so in this work, which came out of researchers at UVic, UBC, um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, there were um, four SRKWs that had muscle tissue that was analyzed for a suite of CECs. And, uh, and, and so those are the four SRKWs that we focused on in our work. And so what we did was we pulled the concentrations of the CECs, uh, and Andy, if I think the next slide has the concentration or the number of CECs. Um, so there were 21 CECs that were detected in the muscle tissue of these four uh, SRKWs, and 16 of them, uh, 16 of the detected chemicals had information in something we call, or that is called ToxCast. So ToxCast is the, uh, a, a source of information on the in vitro bioactivity response. So all of this work that I'm showing here and on the next or on the next slide is looking at in vitro responses. So it's uh, how chemicals are interacting at a molecular and cellular level uh, with mammalian cells. And there is some, some uh, several researchers who are working to translate that into wildlife. Um, and so we have we have some um, uh, as a as a way of starting to think about which chemicals matter. We have some confidence that this is a good approach. So of these twenty one CECs that were detected, we had sixteen that had information that we could work with in order to try to assess the response of the organism. And the way that we are doing this work is we're looking at when the chemical concentrations compared to a measure of biological response exceed a threshold. And when they exceed a threshold, then we say this chemical is one that we think we should be thinking about a little bit more. And so as you can see, Andy, if you can just like point out the threshold there. So we have two chemicals that were detected in the tissues of the, of the whales that exceed um, our threshold. And so both of those, 4-nonophenol and PFOS are endocrine disrupting chemicals. And so um, based on our approach, we would say these are chemicals to think about more. Um, and so that's that. The other part of our framing that we've looked at is, or that we're working on currently through a differently funded project is thinking about how CECs impact populations of salmon and with the idea that that then has an impact 
um, by reducing prey availability. And so what we're doing with that work, and uh, that's, um, we're about, what, about six months into that work now. Um, what we're doing is we're working on, we're, we're working on a salmon population model, which is a life cycle model. And we're focused on the Puyallup um, White River um, system and the Stillaguamish River system. So we'll pull information about chemical concentrations of, of salmon that are, uh, that are present in those two systems, and then also knowledge of the life history of the salmon and using published literature on uh, growth, reproduction, and survival, work on population models to help us understand the impact of a legacy contaminant, and that is gonna be PCB and a CEC, a contaminant of emerging concern, which the current focus is on a PFOS. And just as a way of comparing the difference between legacy contaminants versus the, um, the CECs. So that's ongoing work. Uh, and I suspect we'll start probably within the next six months um, having results we can start talking about and um, as kind of preliminary work. And then the next slide is um, what our next steps are. So the, as Andy mentioned, we have our mixtures work, which again is non-specific for any, uh, any species, but should be a way of thinking about which chemicals matter in Puget Sound with respect to our aquatic life with a focus on mixtures and also an emphasis on endocrine disruption and estrogenicity is, is what we're focused on with that. And so that paper is in kind of finishing touches. Um, and then as I just talked about, we're modeling how CECs uh, affect salmon populations. And then some upcoming work that Andy and I have funded is to look at, uh, uh, focused on the Puyallup White River and the Stillaguamish again, to focus on uh, under, uh, increasing our knowledge of the concentrations of CECs in water. Mm -hmm. And this is characterization and then also uh, trying to lead towards some understanding of source identification. And that work is going to be done with passive sam samplers and Andy is leading that work. And as a, a complementary project, I will be working in the Tacoma Waterway, looking at gene expression in field exposed Chinook, which will um, to hopefully some stormwater events, which um, will have coinciding with that some measurement of the CECs that are present in the water. And that will lead to knowledge of uh, some bioassays that will conduct in the lab. So using what we're seeing with gene expression to inform laboratory bioassays that'll be conducted on uh, sample, um, uh, sampler extract from Andy. So we'll be continue that work with field samples. And then we'll do some model uh, work that will be similar to what we've done with our uh, previously published work and the one that we're working on currently. And so with that, I see Marielle, which is a good cue for me to cut it off, which is great because we're at a question slide. And so I just wanted to um, thank everybody and turn it over at this point. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate the insight into both the research you've done thus far, but also what's on the horizon, because hopefully that sparks some interest and conversation with others. But with that, I'll turn it over to Joe to facilitate some of this q and I know there's already been great discussion in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, Rob. That was great already. I think um, what I'd like to do is see who has um, anybody want to raise their hand. We can actually do some live Q&A first. Looks like we have maybe about nine or 10 minutes. And then there's a couple questions in the typed in Q&A as well. If anybody doesn't have any live, I can jump into that. Okay, I'll keep checking back then. Um, okay, so... Uh, there, this probably would be for, for Andy and Ruth. Uh, Mike Connor has a comment. It seems that stormwater runoff tire particles have been demonstrated to be more of an impact than any other chemical inputs. I don't know if you want to comment on that or just leave that as a comment, Ruth or Andy. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, with respect to mortality, um, I think that's not a chemical that we have included in our assessment in part because we don't have the, um, I guess we didn't have the right data to do that in previous work. Okay. Uh, okay. But yeah, as far as survival, that's a pretty important chemi uh, chemical. Andy? 
And just just the commentary that we have been focusing largely on on Chinook and the the tire wear particles is is um, is, is pretty um, a lot of evidence that coho are way more susceptible than than most other species around. So so um, um, that's kind of our line of thinking in that area. Okay, great. And um, in the in the chat, uh, Kelly uh, Swindle asked, "How is the threshold determined?" Uh, if one of you want to comment on that. I'll take it and Andy can jump in. Um, uh, through a lot of conversation and discussion and input, um, we are using um, kind of, a, so the bioactivity data that we worked with is, if you can imagine, it's it's generated in um, at small scale using cells and components of cells. And so those are added to a tissue plate that has media in it with a chemical added. And so in our thinking, the concentrations in tissue would be approximately, we would expect approximately the same um, uh, exposure concentration as in the tissue as what we're seeing in those tissue plates. And so we're using that tissue concentration of one. So, um, so if there is, uh, if there is an exceedance of where the concentration that's found in the tissue is greater than our measure of response, then we are calling that the potential for that that an exceedance of the threshold. Andy, would you add anything to that? Great. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rob, this one's for you. Marianne Carrasco asked, was air inhalation of contaminants considered uh, in the model, especially near oil spills and other toxic environments? No. Um, you know, we... Um, we based our oil spill scenarios off, you know, the effect side on the Exxon Valdez oil spill. So, um, you know, whether that was actual ingestion of oil or inhalation, I don't know the pathway of effects that that caused that mortality. But that's that's where we took our information on the effects. Um, for the probability that an oil spill would occur and how big would it be, we took those directly from environmental impact statements from Trans Mountain Pipeline and uh, other uh, development applications. Okay, great. Uh, we have a hand raised, Chloe Kodik. Um, you can unmute and ask your question directly if you'd like. Hi, yeah, I popped this in the chat, but sometimes it's nice to hear from an actual person. I was wondering whether any of your models are using West Coast transients, either as a point of comparison or as sort of another source of information since those animals are so much more contaminated than Southern residents? Thanks, Chloe. I'm not sure if that's for me or um, samples from Ruth and, and Andy. It's, it's a good question for both of us, I guess. Why don't you go first, Rob, and then Ruth and Andy can go after that. No, uh, we have not um, looked at that, um, but I I think it's a it's an obvious next step. Um, Chloe's right, you know the contaminant levels are are higher, and the diversity of chemicals um, is you know, the, the suite of chemicals is is also different because they're you know their prey base is so different. I wonder if that may help us refine the effect size, but also maybe that's an indirect way of, of getting at what are the population level consequences, if any, of some of these chemicals where we don't have uh, a nice neat equation to predict it. Um, it's a good idea. Yeah. Andy or Ruth, you wanna take a stab at that? Um, and I mean, the quick answer is no, um, the, the work, that we relied on to draw concentrations in the in the tissue um, only had SRKW skeletal tissue. There was liver uh, concentrations in liver, which we don't know how to interpret where a threshold would be for that. We haven't we haven't we don't feel comfortable with that yet, so we did not consider it. Great, Rob. This one's for you from Julie Irwin. Even if the historically identified threats are mitigated, will this be enough to overcome the recently described effects of inbreeding from the Cardos paper? Uh, we hope so. Um, you know, the the Vortex software 
um, because it was originally developed for the IUCNs, um, they used to be called a captive breeding group. I think they're now called conservation planning group, um, which Bob Lacey has led over the years. Um, he has a, you know, a particular interest in, in keeping those records. And so Vortex keeps a tally of accumulation of, of inbreeding. The, as I understand it, I'm not a geneticist, it's not the level of inbreeding, but it's the um, lethality of the accumulation of, of, um, of those alleles. And so I, I think if our understanding of the lethality of inbreeding um, is correct, that, that alone does not seem to be damning the population or driving them to extinction. And it, we did run some scenarios where we imagined what if we could increase, you know, Chinook salmon abundance to the point that, uh, you know, some of these sub-adult males, if they could live a few years longer or they're physically mature, sexually mature, but they're not socially mature, um, could they become socially mature and contribute uh, to the gene pool? Because as I forget who asked it, um, as you know, um, the the vast majority of calves are being sired by a few old males. If we could get some of these um, teenagers to just live another five years, if we could make them uh, live long enough to become fathers, I think that would also slow down the rate of accumulation uh, of inbreeding. Yeah. But uh, I was I was pleased that um, the the estimates of inbreeding lined up quite nicely with what Cardos measured and reported. Um, but I think the devil's in, in the details of, of what is the demographic consequence of that inbreeding. Great, looks like we have time for one, one more live one. Kelly Swindle, do you um, wanna ask your question? And then uh, Mariel, if you wanna comment uh, about how to handle the last questions at the end, close up, get people to sign up for Future Sound Institute's uh, emails, that'd be great. Go ahead, Kelly. Hey, thanks. Um, just a question about your sample sizes. Um, assuming you've gotten the four samples from um, necropsies, is there any plan or has there been any discussion about doing um, biopsy samples or is there a fear that that might be too stressful on the animals? Oh, you might be best equipped to answer that one. Who, who is that? The um... I was saying you might be, Joe. Oh, yeah. um, I think right now biopsies are low on the table right now because of the, the concern that happened with some biopsy animals a few years ago. Um, so I would say it would the, 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 the need, the scientific value or the need for that would have to be pretty high uh, for for, uh, for probably NOAA to permit biopsying. I, I don't know if I can make a comment uh, for Fisheries and Oceans Canada, but I think people are very reticent right now to open that that uh, avenue of sampling back up again. Great, appreciate that. Well, thank you all for joining today and for the robust discussion and interest. Um, recording and materials will be on our website by the end of the week. Um, to get the latest information on upcoming roundtables, we encourage you to subscribe to Puget Sound Institute's listserv. I also emphasize for next month, we're going to be talking about the science behind hope and climate change doomism. Um, and we will also have our quarterly happy hour up in Bellingham. I'm going to be driving up um, from Seattle, so encourage others uh, or those of you who are farther north to, to join us as well. Um, and for the questions that we didn't have an opportunity to get to, we'll follow up with the, the speakers and try and answer some of those over email. Um, but please don't hesitate to reach out with anything urgent. But thank you all for the time and great insight. Mm -hmm.